some of the UK's biggest companies, and I keep reading environmental assessment reports using Syria 164, which is the old document that we spend quite a lot of time um, superseding. But people are still referring to a document that's no longer current. I don't quite understand why that's happening, so that's the idea of this talk today. Try and sort of like get a bit of interest, I hope, because I think it's quite an interesting subject. Um, a little bit of introduction to Sandfield Engineering. So we're a 50-year-old engineering company supplying the car industry mainly, as we started. Based in Starport on 7, uh, sort of quite, quite local. We deal with Honda, Jaguar, obviously the old uh, mini uh, production lines, uh, Volvo, car companies all around the world. So we are, as a basis, we make manufactured parts for the car industry. You'll probably see the interlink where I came into the business in a minute. Right, hopefully this will work. Right, just thought I'd do a little bit of an introduction to me, myself. Um, not trying to sort of blow my own trumpet. But this is my background, so you know where I came from. I, my, my skill is a maintenance craftsman. I did my apprenticeship with Ford Motor Company. Um, and I've, I've run different businesses. Back in 1996, what I discovered was Ford Motor Company in Leamington Spa, we used to have one of the Europe's biggest pollution foundries. Um, we used to have major pollution incidents. We used to pollute the River Avon. When we had those pollution incidents, we would have a production line would stop. We'd all go into paint mode, we'd put spill mats and everything, sand and everything, trying to gather up all this um, oil that we'd sprayed everywhere. That was the process. And basically what I did, long story to it, but I invented a bladder valve that sat in a drain, Envira valve, which is, I always say is a middle-based technology. It's now quite common, there's lots of companies producing copies of them. Some of them are rather rough and dangerous, but that's what they are. Um, and I've developed those for the fire brigade. The fire brigade use them whenever you see a factory fire, they'll have one on their environmental response vehicles. So that's the sort of background. What I did was I eliminated spill kits and I brought down the actual waste side of it because the idea was if you can contain it and understand your containment, you can recycle, you can gather it, send it back to wherever it came from and get it reprocessed. You actually remove a, a, a major issue. We eliminated pollution incidents from that moment for that particular reason. But also, you didn't have so many people involved in clearing up a, a pollution incident. I've worked for companies like ADI, which is Midlands-based engineering company, quite a large one, about a 90 million pound company, where we deliver FM facilities and engineering to Jaguar various companies. The bit really today is, um, because of my background in inventing this technology, because originally when I did it, the EA told me I was bonkers and barmy, because everything about design is to keep it out of the drains. My philosophy is, but it's going to go in the drains, because you keep designing it so it does flow and move away. So let's look at how we can use drains now in common, isn't it, with flood control containment. Back then it wasn't really that very interesting. Um, when we had the um, Bunsfield explosion, I got involved with the EA to actually look at the, the Syria guidance, so that's where my involvement there. I worked for Hydro International. Hydro International brought me in, they make Hydro you probably know their products, which is a good learning curve for me because I learned about flow control and flow devices. My aim was to actually to link our, our top rock valves onto a hydro brake because I wanted to stall a hydro brake so I could create an attenuation system without waiting for it to fill up. I wanted to do it so we could call it and say, close the valve, attenuate the side so you could control flood, flood with a bit more intelligence. Never got round to it, but I moved on and decided to go back to the company that makes my vows. That's a little bit about me. Right, just to start it off, um, I do quite a bit, or I get involved with UK Spill, probably an area you don't get involved with. This is just a, a, an email, if you read it, from a, a colleague of mine who's quite a senior EA officer that I work quite closely with. So I've worked with him on PPGs uh, in, in, and, and the 10 point checklists over the years. We've known each other quite a long time. And this was a recent conference. Things have changed from where they were five years ago on the environmental side, and businesses aren't aware of it. And I'm sad to say, some of the consultants aren't aware of it either. Businesses have a responsibility. If you have a pollution incident, you are now supposed to have reviewed your risk. And especially if you're in the waste industry, you're supposed to know what's your fire plan. What happens when you have a fire and you put fire water on that, where does it go? There's a responsibility to have actually looked at that risk and analysed whether it's practical to put containment in. Big investment for you guys, because that's been looking at a much bigger, broader opportunity. So that's kind of what the talk's about. But that was just a comment that he sent me. I thought it was really interesting, because this is what's really happening, and this is what I see with customers, because I go to customers all the time going, we haven't got any money to spend on that. We're not interested in that. We've got a consultant that designs all our environmental or a building. I'm looking at it going, but it's wrong. So, Civil 736. Um, you've read it. I, I am actually one of the, the team in it, so that's my claim to fame. Um, as I said, I was invited to be involved with this because I had invented products. Everybody else, if you check them out on there, Peter Rowan, people like that, 
They're all experts in their field, but not many of them are manufacturing. A lot of them come from the consultancy end of things, not actually the manufacturing side. I was building, designing bits of kit to try and get my customers out of jail, and I'll explain some of them later. That's how I got involved with it. Peter Obrey introduced this and was paid quite a lot of money to actually do the presentation for the EA and various groups to, to probably people like yourselves. But they all talked about the concrete structures, and I'm really interested in the risk assessment part within section one to four. I think it's really interesting, it's quite, it's an opportunity, okay? And hopefully when I finish this, you'll, you'll, you'll pick up on what I'm trying to get out. I'm sure you will, but. So, and it's a free download. So unlike all guidances, which cost hundreds of pounds for no reason, the deliberate action from the EA was to fund this so anybody can read it. And they do expect people to read it, and that's just not us, that's actually our customers. So our manufacturing customers are supposed to have read this guidance. Okay, Environment Agency. I have a lot of discussions with the Environment Agency, sort of a bit off, off the wall really, because of my position. I, I'm, I'm neutral, so I don't really have to worry about upsetting anybody really. Um, they, they regulate and enforce. Previous to that, I think be, before sort of 2015, which when the changes came in in December 2015, when they withdrew their PPGs, I know that they're looking at introducing some new PPGs, which is quite good, or I can't quite remember what the name is at the moment. But 2015, they withdrew their PPGs because it was decided they would work more like the EA, uh, sorry, the HSE. So they would be asked to work more as a regulator and not give so much guidance. And they're currently going through a restructuring where you're going to have to pay now for their, before they give quite a lot of site, free site support. It's actually going to be like the HSE, you have to pay for it after the first half an hour or whatever it is. So, Again, they've been made sort of to work more as a regulator. Good thing, bad thing. To me, the idea was, or how it was explained to me, was people like myself, yourselves, we're supposed to, we're paid to know information. So when our customers ask us questions, the reason I use this a lot, it's only guidance, it's not law, but I can use this to say, this is where I think the benchmark starts. You should understand this, this, and this. And I can use this, I think it's a really nice uh, guidance that was written. It's quite simple to use, so it really helps me as a tool because I'm not a, you know, I haven't got lots of let's have to be named, I, maintenance, I look at things in that sort of view, it's really helpful guidance. But it really changed with the environmental sentencing guidelines, I don't know if anybody's read those. I'm looking at you because it's a bit unfair with really. it. So, environmental sentencing guidelines, back to the original note from the EA UK spill. This is crucial because this changed the game in what companies get prosecuted and the fees involved. Prior to this, just you could do it yourself, but our, our, the average sort of fee, fine, sorry, was about £37,000. Since 2014, it's doubled. But it's more, insignificant, more significant because it's based on the turnover of the company. And it's not just the little company, as I mentioned before, ADI, I don't know if you know, Birmingham-based company, Alan Lusty is the chairman, the guy who created it. He's got about 18 different companies in there, one of mine's in there. Him and I fell out a couple of years ago because I was trying to explain to him that if one of those companies has an incident, it's the £90 million group that will be looked at for the fine. No, that can't, that's not right. It'll be, I've set it up so I'm protected. No, it's, it's, it, that's, that's the real the way it works. <coughs> and as you see there, we all know, we all remember Thames Water last year, don't we? There was a £20 million prosecution. Previous to that, it was a million pounds. Same in the type of incident but it went up from a million to 20 million because it's based on the size of the business. Tesco's is a great one because they were fined for 8 million. That was the day that the, um, sadly the um, Grenfell Tower incident happened. So that actually, that the news of that incident came out at the same time as that incident. So a lot of people don't, aren't aware of that one. They've got another fine on its way, or it might be out now. It's going to be in that sort of thing. That's from an oil spill from a garage forecourt, delivery from oil. Tesco's were always challenging the EA about separator designs and interceptor designs for garage forecourt builds. And the EA were waiting for them to have an incident. And when it happened, they were... They, but that, that's the fact. What they do is, they can say, you can turn around and go, right, building regs allow me to do this, this and this. Guidance is just guidance. But then when you have a mistake, you've committed a crime. Once you've committed a crime, the EA can look at it and go, did you put that note before? Did you look at it and put practical pieces in place to actually prevent that incident. If it's pretty blatantly obvious you're unloading a, you know, an, a fuel tanker with 7,800 litres compartment and you've got a separator that can hold about 300 litres, you haven't, you haven't thought that problem. 
you haven't done it right. And that's what happens. So I think that those are the core drivers. Another one that's, I don't know if you get involved, I'm sure you do, the, the waste industry, designing new waste treatment plants. The EA brought, I've just told you they didn't bring out guidance. So in 2016, they decided to bring out a guidance. The reason they brought out guidance was because the waste industry is just rubbish at controlling fire, water, runoff, and pollution. So they brought out a guidance. Section 17 is what I'm interested in. It talks about fire, water, containment. And it tells you to refer to that. But I go around Biffa plants, I go around Orchard plants, I go around all these plants. They've read that, but they haven't linked it to that. And they've gone, oh, it's all right, because our, our local consultant says we're okay. It's not it's an ever-moving opportunity. So what they've sort of said is, yeah, you, you might have a site that's 20 years old, but 20 years ago it was okay. <clears throat> and you're fine if you don't have an incident. But if you have an incident, they'll go, but you should have read that, and that tells you you should have known what levels of pollution you were going to have. You should have known all these bits of information. And, they, and, and it, there's a great opportunity from this. This isn't a negative, it's an opportunity. So, Syria 736. This is what I'm talking about now. I'm going to talk about some of the case studies. I'm going to be a little bit, they are my sites I'm going to talk about, so they're my installations. But I'm going to tell you the truth. So if you've read the guidance, if you get one story, I'm going to tell you what I really know because I worked on them. So the, I'm really interested in the source can be anything. What happens is a lot of people think the source is just that big tank over there. They, they forget that it could be the small, it could be where the driver's moving something around the side. Pathways, this is where you guys come in because this is all this design, understanding the flows and how things move around the site. And the one thing we don't want to get into is the receptor, whether that's the ground or water. You know, I mean, at the moment, everybody's talking about plastic and, and massive pollutions and problem we've got with theirs. This is the same thing. I think, personally, the water side of things, because the public haven't been made aware of it, is probably one of the most underestimated pollution issues we've got. Because if I'm walking around sites and I've got some real horrendous ones that are pumping out cyanide, pumping out all sorts of plate work straight into brooks and streams, and I see this all the time, very difficult for me sometimes because I want to just blow the whistle on, on some of my clients. This isn't being understood. Pollution containment and pollution control has not been understood. Oil separators do not contain chemicals that emulsify water, but customers think they do because they don't understand what a separator is. They don't understand what the drainage structure they've got in the ground and how it works. So, case studies. This is one of the case studies, page 162. I'm going to talk about having metal finishing. It's one of my clients. The story is, 2009, I rang the guy up. I said, I've got this little company. I'm only a little business. I've invented this valve. I've got this bladder system and this mechanical valve. I think it would be really interesting for you. Customer, Graham Bourne at the time, environmental manager, basically told me before let letter where to go. Uh, we are a coma site. We've got everything. We're covered. We've met every compliance. We, we're, we're really good. 2010, the factory burns the ground. <coughs> That's the containment valve that sits in the, on their out external wall. So they thought about firewall containment because it's part of the coma regime. Um, <coughs> That's where it came out of. That valve at the time was shut. It's just a photograph. This is of, of what we remained. The site was completely, completely destroyed. But that allowed cyanide from the firewall runoff to go into the river to kill fish. But there's a bit more to it. A fireman climbed down a river bank to tie a plastic bag around the pipe because he could see that there was something coming out of it they wanted to stop it. So there's a, there's a whole health and safety sort of like, what the hell are you doing? That's the that, that's river anchor, you know, it's quite a big river, you know, and somebody's climbed down there to put a plastic bag to try and stop. Nobody knew it was cyanide until they found out all the fish were dead. Um, with Graham, I say this is a customer that's telling me to F off in... in He's had to move the site now, it's in Hinkley, a, a, a new sort of purpose-built, rebuilt factory. You see the, the bund wall around the outside? This is pre the guidance. So Graham then called me back and said, I think you need to come and help us. We, we need to understand how we can contain it. You see our valves and the drains, they sit sort of here. The idea is if they have an incident now, planning of the 164 they use, but the idea is, is the drainage network closed off and this pad above here is there. Fire water, emergency fire water containment system. Quite a neat idea. But when Graham was doing it, you can see what he's done. You can see they're fine, 166,000. They're actually owned by one of the UK's biggest um, investment groups. <coughs> so you can guarantee if that incident happened today, there'd definitely be a naught on the end of it. And that might make the investors go, Oof, need to understand this a bit more because we don't want to keep investing a couple of thousand pounds on drainage when 
when it goes wrong, we can be looking in the millions, because they certainly would be, because they have a major fish kill. What we found with Graham when I was working with Graham was he said, there's, there's no actual, it's, not all, it's all disjointed, there's nobody I can go to and go, right, can you replicate my fire or my model and show me what happens when my, my building burns down. Um, still running now, that, that system, um, so that's quite, quite a success. This is just me doing a bit of management speak, because sometimes we have to do it to, to certain levels of businesses. We, we work for Marks Spencers, um, and I have to do like a level. What we often see is everybody puts a lot of effort, because that's the bit that receives is primary, so that's like your tanks, the development of your tanks design, and, and it's not that difficult to work out what spec you need, you've got so much volume. Secondary, where well, you could use 110%, can't you, or whatever the rule of thumb is, that's just quite simple, you're probably doing every day. Tertiary, to me, is, is the bigger footprint, it's a bit more complicated, um, and often gets virtually no real investment at all. But how many pollution incidents can anybody think of, didn't actually, and I'm talking water pollution, didn't actually come as a result of the final failure of that? Because I, I, work, I work for hundreds of sites, and normally what it is, is yes, we've had an incident, but it's normally with deliveries, it's normally when people have been moving material around, and it's normally the tertiary that came under attack, and it was the point that released it into the surface water, caused the pollution incident. All these were fine. I'll talk about one of those in a minute. So that's sort of like the model. This is all out of Syria, by the way. So these are all the guidances. So I'm not sort of making this up. I'm, I'm not being clever, really. I'm just saying what's in here for you to use at all. But this is the biggest issue. Everybody knows about the primaries and the secondaries. But these things here, that's where our pollution comes from. Most of the sites we deal with, and I haven't put fire in here because obviously that is the big, bigger cause of this, but most of our significant spillages that cause an effect are because nobody could actually shut down that final flow. That's where obviously I came in with my original inventions and these sort of things. These have to work. These have to work in an emergency. Not, oh, well, they might work or they, well, we don't know where they are. These have to work. So this is the idea of that. But of course, if you block a drain, how much containment have you actually got? If you don't involve, if you don't involve your engineers and your consultants who design drains, it could be completely waste of point, pointless waste of money. And we work with quite a few sites where they've fitted valves because the EA have told them they've got to have an isolation valve. Nobody thought about actually where it might pop out. <clears throat> so you might block that drain there, and it might pop out there, and just track down into the river. Complete waste of investment. You know, complete. I mean. I hate to say, we're doing quite a lot of work on the M5 at the moment, looking at the M5 with WSP. Penstock valves on motorways, can't see the point in them. Because I can't see, A, they don't seal. Who the hell's going to ever get down there fast enough to actually operate them? Because they're all just a manually operate. And then when you actually find them, we've got some sites that we've been to, nobody knows where they are. And some of them are like, you've got to lift a manhole cover, and then you've got a three metre drop shaft down to this valve. Well, to me, you know, that's confined space. It's quite a skilled operation. So this is another one, as the guidance. This is quite an interesting one, because this is well, sort of going to, to hopefully interest you sort of guys here is. That's a 700,000 pound investment for a five water containment power park. Ignore that valve there, because right? that didn't exist. That's actually, the story is that's my valve that I made in my garden shed, because this is PPG Paints, um, Johnson Paint. So I built this, and as a coma site, the the environmental manager said, right, let's test the system. Because in this guidance, because actually Lawrence helped me, this is one of his cases, he, we did a presentation to the team, so we all went for sandwiches and he showed us what he did at this site. But the story is, in here it's kind of different because it's nicely, nicely put out for a, a document. But the story is, he built that, tested it, so ran his hydrants to fill this car park. And he just kept pouring out that valve there. That's a new valve, just kept pouring out. There's no head in the surface water drain. There's no head to actually, that valve there has not been spec as a seal valve, it's basically a penstock valve, it's got a leak rate. And the leak rate was greater than we could actually get any pressure to cause that to actually bridge. The reason I had to make that, was well, the other question is, this is quite common, that's a manually operated penstock valve. Who's going down that river bank along there, which runs along there by the way, when that factory's on fire? Because the fire brigade take over that site. So that valve has got to be automated, but it's also got to be automated off grid, there's no point connecting it to the main power of the site, which is what a lot well, we work for Muller. Muller, all their sites have got these valves. If you get a power cut, the valves don't work. And that's the one time you might have a production failure is when you've got a power cut, because that's when another valve might fail and then it'll discharge milk everywhere. <coughs> so 
This valve, always built in the garden shed, is in here. But the idea of it is, is this is interlinked to the fire alarm, so it instantly drops. As soon as the fire alarm rings on 30 seconds, these valves are remote controlled. We don't, we try not to wire in anything because it's very complicated. This is just my own personal opinion, by the way. But I'm just saying, when you're building a firewall containment system, that valve's got to be a ceiling valve. If the spec says penstock, you're allowing the builder just to fit the cheapest penstock, as in Abbey Metal Finishing found out, as they found out. And if they don't do a test, they might be willfully just carrying on with a valve that when they have that major incident, doesn't actually seal the drains. And that's quite common. Um, we get that quite a lot. This is a local company, Arrow Environmental, based in uh, Black Country, or um, Albury, uh, West Bromwich, I think it is, down there. So it's, it's local to here. They had a fire in 2012. They used this guidance, or they allowed me to use this guidance in an area that hopefully is of interest to you. So what they had was they had a fire, some kids set fire to the factory, and they set fire to some rubbish. These are, I don't know if you've ever been to a factory like this, but they are dirty, horrible places, just oil everywhere. But what happened is they had a fire. From the fire, they had a pollution incident, which involved seven Trent, which involved the HSE, EA, and their insurance company. So they walk onto site, and the first thing they saw was that the buns were made of um, breeze block. So not buns, they're just breeze block walls. So they picked up on, the, on this, this issue with the uh, buns, and they insisted that the site renew all their buns. Well, you can imagine, you, you're looking probably, I don't know, a quarter million, half a million pound investment. This is a 10 million pound turnover business. So it's not going to happen. There's a the real panic. One of the guys on the Syria said, you want to give Dave Cole, he's only in Birmingham, you're going to give him a call, because he was on about this spill modelling, which I'm going to talk about now. He was really <coughs> excited about this development that he'd done. Um, give him a call. What I managed to get with, with, with Arrow was they were the first company to let me model the site for a pollution event to this guidance. So what you've got in this guidance is it gives you, in section 433, it gives you absolute figures. It says, there's your rainwater roughly, look at what your fire brigade can deliver, give us 24 hours of containment, there's your volume, service area, that gives you volume, and then an eight day response plan after that. That took away all that complicated ten different scenarios, it gave me one scenario, that's the scenario I need to model to. We modelled that site, what we were able to do was convince the EA and the insurance company for 35 grand they could put it right, they could actually contain a major incident <coughs> within the footprint of their factory by doing, what, basically removing openings and things like that, and put some, some uh, road traffic uh, humps in to actually deflect the firewater runoff, which is still running today. Um, to me that's the opportunity, that's a company that's really in trouble. The first thing that HSE and EA go in short is your buns are no good. Yes, the buns are no good. What that company's doing now is renewing their buns in stages. But they couldn't have done it in one hit. How do you, how do you suddenly stop a factory and rebuild all your buns in one hit? You know, the business gets bust. But that was the approach to the insurance. All they could see was the buns. What I saw was, so how do you actually solve that? How do you understand the problem? So within the guidance again, I did this with Hydro International, that's why they poached me really, because I set this up. <coughs> is we, we started spill modelling, which is using flood modelling software, true flow, um, micro drainage. What you do is you basically create the same scenario that they've got in there and you model the site, you model the disaster. This is a typical one that we've just done, this is for AG Bar, brand new buildings built at Milton Keynes, the lovely blue and sort of buildings. They had their factory purpose built. Yet somewhere in the in the design, it doesn't work. But it was built, it was supposed to be built <coughs> to suit their requirements. What they got there is a big effluent tank, but they had a had a major leak from it, which caused a pollution incident, which meant they reported it to the EA. The EA turned up and said, Well, we don't like the way that tank's situated. Prove to us that if it fails, you can contain the spill. They can't contain the spill. That's what that's what spill modelling does. It, it says this is what you need to do. And the idea is, which is, should be something you guys would go, right, I get that, is you can then work out, well, how high do I need my tertiary curbing to be to make this work and get it right first time? We keep doing this as retrofits and that's quite difficult. So I'm trying to encourage the sector to start going, building a new factory, right, we're doing all this modelling, let's just do this as a common piece of it. Because then if you know that, and you've got our super duper valve actually blocking the drain, so you know the drain is actually going to seal. You know you're not going to have a valve that leaks. If it leaks, it's a pointless exercise. Um, you can model it. We modelled it. I did this with um, I, don't know if, I did it with a guy called Dave Schofield. I don't know Dave. He's a WSP. He's quite big in flooding. He's in a lot of flooding and that. But we did this. We proved it. We worked it out. 
it was only a matter of, basically a matter of curbing that had to be changed and a bit of um, road traffic prevention here. It wasn't a massive change, it was just understanding what you were actually going to design in the fir first place. At the moment it's very much retro. I think I've got a video, <coughs> I don't know where it will work. So this is one that we've just done, it, it's beyond me this bit, I just know what I want to see. But this is a factory following the Syria guidance that we're currently doing. See the breakout point there, this is the high risk area, that's the breakout point there. What we're looking at there is we've blocked the drains. So we've actually gone on the, on the model that we've done, we've blocked the drains. We've, we've blocked the points here and that allows, so we've got no flow going off site, we create the incident that's, that's set out in here and we see what happens. Once we know what happens, the idea is if where this site wanted about six valves, I think, at first, they actually only needed two. What they needed to do was put some investment into their territory control here, because this is the building they're worried about. They're not worried about these are the buildings of, of risk. But the, what you then see is you then are able to sit in front of directors over the companies, because they might be like me, and who's going, well, you give me lots of flood data with lots of levels, I'm just looking at it, my head's just bursting, because I don't, I don't understand it. But if I see an animation and then somebody says, what you need to do is you need to increase that level from a 100 mil curb to a 400 mil curb. I can understand that. I, if somebody says to me, and that's going to cost you £10,500 to do that, I can understand that. I can make the investment. We, we, we do this all the time. In one of the sites we've got at the moment is one of our customers is Toyota. Toyota have got that around their D-side factory. So it's, it's been built, it's been looked at, they want fire water containment. So they've built pest stop valves. They had an incident last year. That's when they realised well, we can't close those valves. And then when they did close the valves, it just carried on flowing just through the bottom because you're not going to get a perfect seal. So we swapped it to that. That took 15 minutes and that took 15 seconds. It's a really big difference, but what it means is the containment design then starts to work because you can then start to put that modelling into place. And the modelling, we've done the Royal Mint, I'm kind of, my issue is I promote it and I can sell it easy because when I explain to a company what we're going to do, but I shouldn't be doing it really. It should be coming from the new build. It should be actually being done in, at the design stage. We've got one at the moment, which is a project for Premier, Premier Nutrition in Fratley Park for a new site. They've had the modelling done, the flood risk, the fire water risk assessment, serial 164. To me that's complete, but lots and lots of flood and fire risks. They need to do one. They need to do one, and somebody needed to animate it and make it absolute. And it's all just to do with flood modelling, which is probably something the guys in here are going, well, that's easy. It's just understanding, because then a customer like me can understand what I'm actually looking at. I can do these now and go, there is no point at all in buying a valve. I'd, I'd like to sell you a valve, but there's no point. This one here, I had a great discussion with them because other people were trying to put valves in all sorts of manholes. That's a siphonic drainage system. So this is, an open, this is the open, open point, you see, yeah. but they had other contractors coming and going, yeah, we can put some little valves in here on a siphonic drainage. I, you know, I'm not that great, but I know that I wouldn't want to stop a flow coming off a siphonic drainage with a dead stop valve that just shuts it, because where's that energy going to go? You know, we work with sites where the drainage covers have been blasted off by people putting pieces of equipment in, because they don't know what they're doing. So... <clears throat> I always finish with this one because I've got a big bugbear about people putting the word penstock. I had penstock removed from there. So if you do a thing and Google penstock, I think it comes up once. But I, I kept saying to them, please do not put the word penstock. We use closed, closed, drainage closure device now. Um, the chances are, unless you make it very clear, the builder will put a penstock in. And he'll pick the cheapest penstock he can get away with. So he'll put a mechanical valve in. It's finding out what the customer actually wants. The customer probably is looking at it going, well, I've just been told by the EA and I need a drainage closure system. If they put a penstock in, I'll, I'll, I have no, it won't work. Every site I've dealt with has got these penstocks. We turn up, we service them all, and they're great. They're great flow control guys. They'll last for years, but they will not work for a pollution containment system unless you've actually specified that it needs to seal. And I mean, there are, there's butterfly valves, there's valves that are, are out there, but it needs to be the right product, not a loose word, which is something that I'd like to, I'd like to eliminate, and we sort of pencil out closure device, so it gives a specification. Um, this was just, a, this, is, this is actually just a little video. 
that's Muller, that's one of my customers, that's a penstock valve, that's for their main plant, that's a surface water runoff emergency valve, that's what we had. That's a pollution incident, that's, there's nothing I can do, that's